Welcome back to this lecture on biochemical engineering. If you remember what we did in the last class was essentially we are looking at multiple receptors and what happens when the, in the species in the, in, the, in, the complex, in the ligand binds to multiple receptors. We talked about the fact that these multiple receptors essentially bind independently to the ligand and the binding of one does not influence the other. And then we said, is it possible to determine separately whether these multiple receptors, receptor 1, the amount that receptor 1 binds to the ligand, the amount that receptor 2 binds to the ligand? We said, well, it's not always easy to uh, figure out because what we do is we label the uh, ligands essentially. So uh, the ligand, if there is one kind of ligand, it will either bind to receptor 1 or bind to receptor 2. And there is, you know, we're just looking at the fluorescence or some kind of labeling. And it's not possible to figure out in general whether receptor 1 binds or is it binds to receptor 1 or it binds to receptor 2. In some extreme cases, obviously, it's possible. And what are those cases? So the case that we talked about was when a receptor of a particular kind has a much higher binding affinity than the receptor of the other kind. And if you remember, so we, this was what we're look, doing if, it, if I go to the screen now. So a receptor 1 and receptor 2 bind and the steady state concentration of the complex is the, the amount of receptors uh, 1 binding to the ligand plus the amount of receptor 2 binding to the ligand. So the first term you find here which is NC CL0 NRT1 over CL0 plus KD1 that is the amount of receptor uh, ligands binding to receptor 1 and the second term that you see here CL0 NRT2 over CL0 plus KD2 that is the uh, recept am am amount of ligands binding to receptor 2. So the fact is that each of these receptors act independently and bind independently and there is no, no influence of the binding of one receptor to the binding of the other. But it is possible, as I said, to distinguish between the two values if the KD, that is the dissociation rate constant of receptor, of the binding of receptor 1 is much, much higher or much, much lower than the receptor uh, binding rate constants of the second one. Now, if you remember, so we went through the calculations and I'm not going to repeat all of that. And when we did the calculations, we took the case when the amount of complex that was there at the beginning was zero and we did all the calculations. And what I want to attract your attention to is this fact, this biphasic nature of the curve. So what you see over here is NC over NRT and, and this is time. So you have a single receptor and in the case of a single receptor, the curve is monophasic, whereas in the case of two receptor, the curve is biphasic. Now, as you can see over here, these are data here and I'm going to look at, look at that. So, look at the KD1. The KD1 is 1 micromolar and the KD2 is 100 micromolar. So, there is a two orders of magnitude difference between the dissociation rate constants of 1 and 2. So, if KD1 is 100 times, uh, so here if KD1 is much, much smaller than KD2 as, is, as the case is, then k1, k minus 1, let's say, over k1, that is the backward rate constant over the forward rate constant is much smaller than k minus 2 over kd2, which means affinity of receptor 1 is much, much higher than affinity of receptor 2. Right? So, this is, this is what we uh, concluded, that the affinity of receptor 1 is much, much higher than receptor 2, if this, this is the case. And these are cases when we can really distinguish between the two kinds of receptors, because as I just showed in the biphasic response that, I showed, that we had, so what does this lead to if KD1 is much, much smaller than KD2? What this leads to is that in the exponential graph that you have, the slopes of the exponential graph at all points of time will be very different. And what you see is that there is a clear biphasic nature or in other words, the slope increase in a cer certain way and then they decrease suddenly. So, if I can go back to the uh, screen quickly, so you will see that the, this, is, this is the slope, say so, uh, some kind of exponential, but this exponential, sl the slope of this curve, whether it is exponential or, or something close to linear, does not matter, is very, very different from the slope of the next curve. So, which means what? That if these two receptors are there and the KD1 of one is much, much smaller than the KD, KD, KD of the other, or in other words, receptor 1 has a much higher affinity than receptor 2, then this implies that uh, 
whenever you let these ligands lose on the system, okay, so whenever you let these ligands lose on, lose on the system, so receptor 1 will capture these ligands, so the ligands are around, so receptor 1 will immediately come and bind with the ligand. So as a result, the initial amount of binding that will occur will essentially be because that of receptor 1. Okay. So, once we understand them, then, then we realize that yes, the two slopes are very different from each other. So, initially you have a much higher slope and then the slopes decrease with time. So, what this implies is that, what this implies is that for the case when the slope is higher or in the initial time period, so as soon as you let the ligands loose on the receptors, the receptor 1 is binding with the ligand. So, this will essentially imply that the receptor, uh, the, the first slope, that is the higher slope, that, that corresponds to the binding of receptor 1 to the ligand. It is not that receptor 2 does not bind at all, but the fact of the matter is that much of the binding that occurs, most of the binding that occurs is because of receptor 1. And if you come to think of it, you know, if you come to think of these two as competitive binding, that is receptor 1 is binding competitively to receptor 2, then what you realize is that uh, because the rate constant or the affinity of receptor 1 is 100 times that of receptor 2, so the bindings would always be in the ratio, more or less in the ratio of 1 is to 100 or 1 is to 99. So, if 100 ligands bind, 1%, only 1% of them is binding to receptor 2 and 99% of them is binding to receptor 1. So, how does this help us? How does this knowledge help us? You know, I gave you a problem at the end of the last class and I will go back to that problem. This helps us in identifying the rate constants of the system because just as I said that when we label the ligands, there is no way for us to label the receptors, we are only labeling the ligands. So, when we label the ligands, what happens is that uh, we can only figure out that what is the total amount of complex that has been formed and there is no way for us to separate out the receptor 1 from receptor 2 or the con rate constants of receptor 1 from receptor 2, but what we essentially want to measure are the rate constants of receptor 1 and receptor 2. So, how do we go about it? So, what we do, we choose a ligand, we purposely choose a ligand. So, think of that you are doing an experiment and how, how do you go about it? So, you can only label your ligands, you cannot label your receptors, so what do you do? You purposely choose a ligand such that it binds both to receptor 1 and to receptor 2, but the binding rate constant or the KD, uh, the uh, dissociation rate constant, the binding affinity of, res of the ligand for receptor 1 is much, much higher than the binding affinity for the ligand for, uh, of the ligand for receptor 2. Okay, so that, that is a, that's a highlight, that's a, that's a point that you need to exploit. So, once you've understood that, what you do is you essentially figure out, okay, so if one is 100 times the other and if you l let the reaction happen for a certain period of time, initially what will happen is, if the reactor 1's affinity is higher, much, much higher than receptor 2, what will happen is all of it will go, the ligands will all, most of the ligands will actually go and bind with receptor 1. So, that, that is essentially that is going to happen. Then what happens? As time progresses, the receptor 1 is going to be more or less saturated. And then is when you see that bend in the curve that, just, uh, that I showed you just now. So, receptor 1 is more or less saturated. As a result, what happens is now receptor 2 starts to bind to the ligand. And this is the uh, this, is the, this, this is the mechanism or the hypothesis, so to say, that is, that is what we are going to exploit as we try and solve the problem. So, let us go to the problem. So, this is the problem that I gave you and what I asked you to do is that NC equals CL0 NRT1 over CL0 over KD1 plus CL0 NRT2 over CL0 plus KD2. So, let us write this. So, NC equals CL0 NRT1 over CL0 plus KD1 plus CL0 NRT2 CL0 over KD2. So, one of the ways of tackling this is essentially just what I said that, you know, it is very hard to be able to figure out. So, you just have one curve, come to think of it, you just have one curve. So, when you had, uh, let us go back to this and when you had a single receptor, this was your scatchet plot, right? So, when you had a single receptor, you had two unknowns, one was NRT and the other one was KD and you could draw a scatchet plot which was linear and from the slope you figured out NRT, uh, KD sorry and from the intercept you could figure out NRT. So, two rate const two constants you needed to figure out, you had one plot and from the slope you figured one and from the intercept you figured another. But here what happens is, the, the problem that I gave you sorry, uh, 
so the, the, the problem that I gave you here, the, pro, the problem with this is that you have 1, 2, 3, 4. So, 4 unknowns and 1 plot. Okay. So, how do you go? So, this can at most give you 2 unknowns. So, how do you figure out the other 2 unknowns? So, what we do is we obtain a scattered plot. Okay. Now, typically a scattered plot would be linear. So, if you do n c over c l naught over n c, then for a particular value of c l naught, c l naught equals say uh, 1 micromolar, 1 micromolar or 10 micromolar something like that. This is, this is what you get, this is your uh, plot. But in this case, what will happen is that given that k d 1 is much, much less than k d 2, Okay, so uh, your plot is going to be something like let's keep this formula next to each other. Uh, okay, so your plot is going to be something like this and this. Okay, why is that going to be the case? The, the reason is that n c equals n c one plus n c two. Okay that is what my total. So, the complex form from receptor 1 and the complex form from receptor 2. Okay. That is what it is going to be. Right? So, when that is the case, then when you have a limited amount of a small amount of complex that is formed, what will happen is much of it will be from receptor 1. Is it clear? Why is that going to be from receptor 1? Because receptor 1's affinity or affinity of receptor 1 is much, much greater than that of receptor 2. Okay. So, that, that is what will happen. So, you will have m most of it will be formed from receptor 1. Now, once receptor 1 is more or less saturated, most of the receptors are bound to the ligand, then only receptors 2 starts to form. Right? So, then what happens is you can exploit this as receptor 1. You can call this almost as receptor 1 and this would be primarily receptor 2 plus maybe receptor 1 also. Okay. So, what we do now? So, we have our uh, equation n c equals n c 1 plus n c 2 which equals C L naught n r t 1 over C L naught plus k d 1 plus C L naught n r t 2 over C L naught plus k d 2. Now, for the first part of the plot, so if my scattered plot is something like this n c over C L naught over n c, this n c that you get over here is essentially n c 1, okay, this value. So, I can straight away from the, so, so if I take this, this part of the plot over here, I can straight away say that the slope of this equals the slope of the first part equals minus 1 over k d 1 and intercept uh, intercept equals n r t over k d 1. Okay. I can straight away say this. So, what happens is essentially I use the first part of the slope to evaluate both my k d 1 and n r t 1 and the second part I can calculate I can assume that both uh, receptor 1 and receptor 2 are present and I can go ahead and calculate everything I want. Or second part, you can make, I can make an even more simplifying assumption and say that this is equivalent to n c 2, in which case the slope of this will give me minus k d 1 over minus uh, 1 over minus k d 2 and the intercept will give n r t 2 over k d 2. So, that is a possibility. So, I can do something like this. So, if that is the case, then slope this is n c over c l naught over n c, then slope equals uh, minus 1 over k d 1 intercept equals n r t 1 over k d 1 and slope here can be minus 1 over k d 2 and intercept equals n r t 2 over k d 2. That is a possibility or here you can assume both uh, interceptor 1 and receptor 2 to be acting, in which case you have to do a little more complicated calculation, but this is something you can definitely take.
So, that is, a, that is the way we solve this, otherwise there is no other way of looking at it. Now, let us look at a some other things here, some other variations of the problem over here. Uh, as you can see, that what we are talking over here is now start to talk about here is interconverting receptor subpopulation. So, something like where the receptors convert within uh, from to into each other, two different forms. So, it's essentially what happens is that in the previous, uh, uh, previous part of the lecture, what we talked about are receptors that work completely independently of each other and they bind to the ligand independently. What we are going to talk about now are cases where the receptors bind, but they do not bind independently. Okay. They bind, there is an interdependence between these receptors or in other words, the receptor populations are subpopulations which are interconverting to each other. And what we mean when we say we are, they are interconverting to each other, essentially it is a sort of morphological change, you know, it is a conformational change that is happening in the receptor. So, it is not the chemical composition of the receptors uh, as such that are changing, but the conformation of the, the conformational change occurs in the receptor. And what does the conformational change entail? It essentially means that the rate constants, the dissociation and the association constants or in other words the binding rate constants would change for these cases. So, let us look, let's look at uh, this. So, interconverting receptor subpopulation. So, if you look at the screen what happens is that uh, often the receptor undergoes a conformational change just as I said after binding to the ligand. Okay. And so, when we are talking of two different receptor populations, how does this differ from what we had done before is that what we had done before were two completely different receptors which have affinity for the same ligand. Here is not that case, it is not two completely different receptors, but the same receptor which is undergoing conformational change and as a result the dissociation and the association constants are differing here. So, the change however, does not affect sub, uh, subsequent ligand receptor binding. So, uh, and, but there is a conformational change that occurs and the most general case the receptor is present as an interconverting subpopulation that is what we are going to talk about in model today. And so, in the most general case the receptor is present as an interconverting subpopulation and these subpopulations have differences in rates of dissociation and association between receptors and ligand. So, just as I said that so, because of the conformational change what results uh, because of the uh, conformational change is essentially the fact that these receptors have different kinetic constants. Okay. So, now let us look at uh, the model that we have over here the interconverting receptor subpopulation model. So, as you can see over here this is the most general form of the model R 1 plus L. So, R 1 is my receptor population 1. R 2 as I said is same chemically the same receptor, but just to con uh, R 1 with the conformational change. So, R 1 plus L forms the complex C 1 and R 1 also forms the complex uh, changes to R 2 and forms the complex uh, C 2. So, this picture may be slightly uh, confusing. So, what I will do is I am going to uh, write this differently. So, R 1 plus L K 1 1, K minus 1, C 1. So, R 1 is essentially uh, re reacting with ligand to form the complex C 1 and R 1 is going through a conformational change to form R 2. Okay. And then you have R 2 plus L. So, again it reacts in a similar way as R 1 K 2 2 and K minus 2 are its rate constants to form C 2 and these are the complexes. This is a complex and this is a complex and it turns out that the complex themselves can undergo conformational change to rotate between each other. So, this is C 2. Uh, and the rate constants for this are k 1 2 and k minus 1 2. So, this is the set of reactions interconverting receptor interconverting receptor sub populations. So, what is happening is that the receptor 1 is binding with ligand to form a complex and the rate constants forward and backward rate constants for that are k 1 1 and k minus 1. Uh, 
receptor 1 is undergoing a conformational change to form R2 and the rate constants for that are K21 and K-21 and R2 re reacts with the ligand as it is to form a complex C2 and uh, C2 and C1 undergo conformational change again. So, if you look over here, go back to the screen and look over here, you find that this is the way we have represented it. This is a slightly confusing way of looking at it and therefore, I drew it, but you can write this cyclical way. So, remember the only thing I want to point out here is that it is R1 when I draw these, the, the, this line for example, the one, the vertical line on the left, it is only the conversion between R1 and R2 and L is not involved in this reaction. Okay. Now, a special case of this is what you see over here, where the receptors themselves do not uh, change conformation, but it is the complex that changes conformation. So, R1 reacts with the ligand to form complex C1, and it is C1 that changes conformation to form complex C2, and the rate constants are K11 and K-1 and K12 and K-2. So, essentially what we have done is, if you take the cyclical model up here, if you cut out these two parts, these two lines over here and these two lines over here, you get R1 plus L gives C1 and C1 gives C2. So, you get this triangle over here and that is the special case. So, what we will do now in the, in the remaining part of this lecture is essentially uh, look at and model these. So, what, what we will do is to start with is we will look at the special case B first, the reason being that it is easier to model. So, we will come back and look at a after that, but uh, essentially we will look at B first. So, in B let us look at this. So, R 1 plus L K 1 1 is a forward rate constant, K minus 1 is a backward rate constant and C 1 and C 2 are the complex which undergo conformational change through the rate constants K 1 2 and K minus 1 2. So, what happens when there is steady state? Okay. When there is steady state, uh, you, you can relate the N C 2 and N, N C 1, that is the rate constant 1 and rate constant 2. Let me work this out for you, so how this happens. Fine, C 1, K 1 2, K minus 1 2 and C 2. So, what is, let, let us write all these, so D N R 1 D T, what is that equal to? That equals uh, K minus 1, 1, uh, NC 1 minus K 1, 1, NR 1, CL naught, right. Now, what would be my D and C 1, D and C 1 DT, that equals, that is a little longer one. So, uh, K uh, 1, 1, n r 1 c l naught minus k minus 1 1 uh, n c 1 minus k 1 2 n c 1 plus k minus 1 2 n c 2 and what would be my d n c 2 d t that simply equals k 1 2 n c 1 minus k minus 2 1 and C 2. So, at steady state each of these would be 0. Okay. So, at steady state each of these would be 0. So, if that is 0 then from this equation the last equation let us call this equation A, B and C. Okay. Then from equation C, from equation C what we find is K 1 2 N C 1 at steady state equals K minus 1 2 N C 2. Let me go through this again. So, these are my set of equations that I wrote. These are the, these are the model equations that uh, dynamic model. Let us forget this steady state for a minute. So, this is what I have and steady state model. So, N R 1 is being formed uh, because of, so the, the uh, NR1 is being formed because of this reaction and, and it is being destroyed or uh, removed because of the forward reaction. NC1 is formed from this reaction as well as this reaction and it is also removed because of this reaction 
as well as this reaction. So, four terms here and whereas, C 2 is formed in the forward direction and uh, destroyed or removed in the backward direction. At steady state all these three have to be 0. So, what we do we first equate the simplest one the second one to be equal to 0. Okay. So, this, this is what we get. So, what we immediately get is that uh, N C 2 equals K 1 2 over K minus 1 2 uh, times N C 1 or in other words uh, if uh, K D 1 2 is written as uh, K minus 1 2 over K 1 2 then this is written as N C 1 over K D K D 1. Okay. So, that is what I get. Now, what is my N C N C? N C would be N C 1 plus N C 2, right? which means that N C 1 plus N C 1 over K D 1 that equals N C 1 plus 1 over K D 1. Fine. Now, what is my N R T? N R T is the total amount of receptors which is N R 1 plus N C 1 plus N C 2 or in other words receptors that are completely free okay, and receptors that are in complex 1 and receptors that are as complex 2. So, this I can write now as N R 1 plus I have already cal calculated what my N C 1 and N C 2 together is which is N C 1 plus 1 over K D 1. So, now if I go back to my equation over here, okay, if I go back to my equation over here, so this has to be 0 at steady state also, this has to be 0. So, what we can do is if I equate this to 0, I get a relationship between N R 1 and N C 1 straight away. Okay. Let us do that. So, so, so equating A to 0, so A is this uh, equation out here. Okay. So, A is this equation, I am equating this to 0, which means that K minus 1 N C 1 equals K 1 1 N R 1 C L naught. Okay. So, N C 1 equals K 1 1 over K minus 1 N R 1 C L naught. Okay. Fine. So, this is what I get. Uh, so, N R 1 equals uh, K minus uh, K minus 1 1 over K 1 1 times 1 over C L naught times N C 1 over C L naught. So, this I can write as K D 1 1. Okay. Uh, previously, I had written K D 1 2. So, I can use this for K D 1 1. So, C L naught. Fine. So, this is 1. So, N R 1 equals K D 1 uh, N R 1 equals this, let me just put it over here like this here. So, N R 1 equals K D 1 N C 1 over C L naught and N C 2 equals N C 1 over K D 1. Now, what was my constraint equation? My constraint equation was that N R T simply equals N R 1 plus N C 1 plus N C 2 or I had written this as uh, N R 1 plus N C 1 times 1 over K D 1. Now, N R 1 I can write now from the from the previous equation I can write it as N R 1 N C 1 over C L naught plus N C 1 over 1 over K D 1 K D 1 2 sorry this is K D 1 2. So, now I can write this as N C 1 K D 1 1 over C L naught plus 1 over K D 1 1 1 2. Right. So, this is this is what I get. So, this is my relationship between N C N C 1 and N R T. Okay. So, N R T times C L naught if I write then it will be N C 1 K D 1 1 
plus C L naught times 1 over K D 1 2. So, this is this is a relationship I have between these. So, N C equals N C equals N C 1 plus N C 2 okay, which I have written it previously if you remember as N C 1 over 1 over K D 1 2. Now, N C 1 I can now write as N R T over time C L naught divided by K D 1 1 plus C L naught 1 plus K D 1 2 okay, times this factor over here which is 1 over K D 1 2. So, this is my relationship that I have uh, uh, between these numbers. So, uh, I can one of the things I can do is try and convert uh, this into a slightly more uh, handleable form which is uh, k d 1 2 plus 1 and divide this by uh, k d 1 1 k d 1 2 plus C L naught 1 plus K D 1 2. I can write it like this or I can make it even simpler and write this as N R T C L naught divided by K D 1 1 uh, K D 1 2 plus C L naught divide this by 1 plus k d 1 2. Okay. So, this is my final relationship between n c and n r t. So, if I want to draw my sketch it plot which will be n c over c l naught that would simply be equal to n r t divided by c l naught plus k d 1 1 k d 1 2 divided by 1 plus k d 1 2. So, I can draw a plot like this. So, if I now go back to the screen, this is exactly I, what we derived n c equals n c over c l naught equals n r t divided by c l naught over k d 1 1 times k d 1 2 divided by 1 plus k d 1 2. Okay. So, this is this is the plot that I want to obtain. So, why did I why did I do it this way? Why did I club club it this way? Because if I am to do, draw a plot of n c, so wh what do I do? I can write this as k d apparent okay my apparent rate constant i can write so if you look at this it even has the units of rate constant correctly so i can write this as k d apparent which is k d 1 1 times k d 1 2 divided by k d 1 2 so what will happen is if i can now write my plot as n c l n c over c l naught equals n r t over c l naught plus k d apparent okay so what i can do is if i take a um, if i you can i can either do it this way which is cl not over nc equals cl not over nrt plus kd apparent over nrt where kd apparent is this number which is k d 1 1 times k d 1 2 divided by k d 1 2 plus 1 fine this is my number. So, what I can do over here is if I draw a plot of C L naught over N C versus C L naught what do I get? I just get a straight line something like this I just get a straight line something like this and the slope of the straight line is 1 over n r t whereas, the intercept is k d apparent over n r t. So, what I can straight away do is from the slope I can calculate my n r t and from the intercept 
I can calculate my KD apparent. So, what was the whole idea of this entire process was to be able to, we had plenty of constants out there, KD11, KD12 and CL0 and CL0 is not a constant, but it is something that we can vary, but NRT. So, what was the idea was to, the idea was to club these three constants that we had into two, because two is something very measurable and write the equation in such a way that we can plot it very easily. So, what we managed to do was write the equation in a way where it is a straight line and we could just, uh, uh, just get the NRT from the intercept and KD and just get the NRT from the slope and the KD apparent from the intercept. So, that was what we are tra we're trying to do. So, this is a special case, the uh, case where the receptors themselves are not interconverting, but the complexes are interconverting. So, what about the more complex case now? And as I just said that this set of reactions could be replaced by this set of reactions are actually written by this set of reactions. And what, what do we do? You know, how can we uh, look at this and model this now. This is slightly more complicated one. The process that we are going to do and I probably am not going to have the time to work out the whole thing, but we will start to work out and the process that we are going to have do is exactly the same process. So, this is this is my plot, this is my, uh, these are my sets of reactions and all we have to do, we have to write balances for each of these R1, R2, C1, C2 and let us try and do that to, to start with. Okay. So, R1, the balance from R for R1, so it just for a second I will keep this out here, so that you can write these set of reactions down. So, R1 plus L K1, uh, forward reaction K11 backward K minus 1 gives C1, R1 uh, forward reaction K21 and K minus 21 gives R2, R2 plus L forward reaction K22 backward K minus 22 gives C2 and C1 forward reaction K12 backward reaction K minus 12 gives C2. So, let us try write the balances for R 1 now first. So, R 1 is being formed by this reaction K minus 1 1 and C 1 and is being removed or being depleted by this reaction uh, and R 1 times C L naught. And for another, another set of reactions and R for that R 1 is being formed from K minus 2 1 n r 2 and being depleted from k minus k 2 1 n r 1. Okay. Similarly, n r 2 d t is being formed for from k 2 uh, k minus 2 2 times n c 2 and depleted from k 2 2 n r 2 n r 2 times C L naught and there is the other interconverting reaction which is it is being formed from k 2 1 n r 1 and depleted from k minus 2 1 n r 2. Okay. And what about C 1 and C 2? That also you have uh, two sets of reactions. So, this is this is the set of reactions for n r 1 and n r 2 and if you look at C 1 and C 2. So, D and C 1 D T equals K 1 1 N R 1 C L naught minus K minus 1 1 uh, N C 1 okay. and then you have uh, K uh, minus 1 2 N C 2 minus K 1 2 and C 1 and similarly we can write the balance for C 2 which is K uh, 2 2 in R 2 C L naught minus K minus 2 2 in C 2 plus K 1 2 n c 1 minus k minus 1 2 n c 2. So, these are my four balance equations that I that I write and what do I do with them? So, at steady state I have to equate all of these to be 0 to equal to 0. Okay. So, let us look at uh, 
the total amount of complex that we have. So, this is my set of equations for NC1. So, let, what, let us look at the total amount of complex that we have which is NC1 plus NC2. What is that number? If I add all the terms that I get over here, I get K11 NR1 Cl0 minus K minus 11 NC1 plus K22 NR2 Cl0 minus K minus 2 2 NC2. Okay. And for NR1 and NR2, if I add the two equations NR1 plus NR2, uh, just this is not yeah basically these are adding these two equations. So, this is at steady state uh, this is uh, I am basically this is d d t of this at steady state this equals 0. Similarly, d d t of n r 1 plus n r 2 equals k minus 1 uh, minus 1 1 n c 1 minus k 1 1 n r 1 c l naught plus k minus 2 2 n c 2 uh, n r 2 n c 2 sorry n c 2 minus k 2 2 n r 2 c l naught. So, this is what we get. So, uh, and this equals 0 at steady state. So, what we have to do essentially is that it is a little more cumbersome process. So, what we have to do essentially is that we have to solve for n r 1, uh, n r 2 and let us say n c 2 in terms of n c 1 in terms of n c 1 let us say something like that. So, when we do that then uh, what we can do from here, what we can get from here is that we can replace everything uh, in terms of NC1. Now, what was my constraint equation? If you look at these uh, two sets of reactions that I have written over here, this is let us go one by one. So, this is NR1 and NR2 and this is NC1 and NC2. If you add these all these four sets of reactions, what do I get? If I add all these four, what I get is DDT. If you look at these equations of n r 1 plus n r 2 plus n c 1 plus n c 2 the summation is d d t of that the summation is 0 okay. which means that n r 1 plus n r 2 this implies that n r 1 plus n r 2 plus n c 1 plus n c 2 they all their sum come out to be a constant which is n r t that is the total amount of receptors present or in other words the total amount of receptors that was present is divided into the receptor 1 that is free receptor 2 that is free receptor 1 complex that has been formed and receptor 2 complex that has been formed. Okay. So, we go through these calculations and I am skipping the details of the calculations because we uh, do not really have a lot of time. So, once we go through these calculations, if you look at the screen, what you find over here is that this constraint equation that I wrote. So, what you need to do, you have to keep substituting everything. So, you decide that you want to substitute everything in terms of say N C 1. So, you convert N R T 1 as write it as in terms of N C 1, substitute here, convert N R T 2 and write it in terms of N C 2 and substitute here and N C 1 sorry and substitute here and write N C 2 also in terms of N C 1 and substitute over here. So, once you do all that, what you will find is just like in the previous case, just like in case B as we did, case B we did explicitly and here also you will find just like in case B that N C could be written as C L naught N R T over C L naught plus K D apparent. Okay. So, this is this is what you can write. So, N C over C L naught is N R T over C L naught plus K D apparent, where K D apparent is slightly more complicated over here. It is K D 1 1 times 1 plus K D 1 over K D 1 2 1 over 1 plus K D 1 2, which could also be written as K D 2 2 times 1 plus K D 2 1 over 1 plus K D 1 2. Okay. And these all these numbers are written over here. So, K D 1 1 is the dissociation rate constant for uh, for the first case here that is k d minus 1 1 over k d 1 1 k d 2 1 is k d minus 2 1 over k d 2 1 or in other words the dissociation rate constant over here uh, 
between the two receptor subpopulations. So, this is the way the receptor is the changing conformation k d 1 2 equals k d minus 1 2 over k d 1 2 which is how the complexes are changing conformation and that is the dissociation rate constant for that and k d 2 2 equals minus k d 2 2 over k minus k 2 2 over k 2 2. Okay. Uh, so, this is how the, the second receptor is binding to the complex. So, this, this is the thing. Now, what happens is what you had been able to do or we had been able to do through this process is we had these 1 2 3 4 constants and NRT of course, the fifth constant. So, we have been able to reduce these five constants into two or in other words K d apparent if you look at it involves all these constants. So, what we had been able to do in the process is we had been able to reduce these four constants into a single constants K d apparent and why did we do that? The reason is again this and the same reason that we had before which is that we it is very hard to be able to be able to handle all of these. So, what uh, so what we essentially have is just one equation over here. So, n c equals n c 1 plus n c 2 equals c l naught n r t over c l naught plus k d apparent. Okay. So, this is my equation. So, the advantage is n c over c l naught equals n r t over c l naught plus k d apparent fine. So, C L naught over N C equals C L naught over N R T plus K apparent over N R T. So, what do you do? You perform take different values of C L naught, label the uh, ligands and you perform your experiments for each of these sets and, and then you find out that what uh, what you essentially you know what, what is the ratio of C L naught over N C for each of these sets and, and measure it in terms of C L naught. So, uh, essentially this is your if you want to plot it over here, this is your plot. So, C L naught over N C and uh, this is C L naught. So, just as I said that this is going to be a straight line over here and the slope is going to be equal to 1 over n r t and the intercept is going to be k d apparent over n r t. Okay. So, this is this is essentially what we get and k d apparent over here equals k d 1 1 uh, over 1 plus slightly complicated formula 1 plus k d 1 2 divided by 1 plus k d 2 uh, 2 1 right here and divided by k d 1 k d 1 2. So, this is my formula. So, what we essentially do we conduct experiments with taking different amounts of ligands and figure out how much is my total uh, fluorescence that I get that is the total amount of complexes that have been formed and we measure that and plot it against the amount of ligands that are there. So, in case 2 uh, in the case 1 this is case 1 and case 2 we did separately, but if we have been able to do case case 1 which is a lot more complicated case than case 2, then case 2 would fall out would be a natural fallout of case 1 and it would come as 1 over uh, it come in when the case uh, for the case that 1 over k d 2 1 is 0 or uh, this case that is 1 over k d 2 1 is 0 or in other words k d 2 1 is much much greater than k d minus 2 1 okay. that is or in this this case this step is not there. So, if you go to k, uh, uh, case b you will see that what is case b? Case b is when the receptor populations they are themselves are not interconverting, but it is the complexes that are interconverting and when does that happen? When there is no con uh, no direct interconversion between the re uh, receptors. So, if you look here, so what we are doing here is that there is this reaction between the receptor interconversion and that reaction has to be absent. Okay. So, I think we more or less looked at different cases over here and what you see on the screen right now is a summary of the in different processes that we looked at. So, if you remember, so this is I will run you through very quickly. So, we started with a single receptor case and let, uh, let me go through this very quickly and try and summarize what we have done in the last few cases. So, remember this was a very important uh, plot that we looked at uh, just say. So, this is this is where we started with this is a single receptor uh, ligand binding case where there is a receptor bind, binding to a single receptor binding to a single, single ligand and we assume that there is no receptor uh, 
depletion out here. So uh, we got straight you know, linear scatchered plots and stuff like that. And then we started to look at, so this was the simplest case possible. And for this case, the scatchered plot is linear, it's a straight line. Okay, the scatchered plot is essentially the important plot that we'll keep looking at here. And NC over CL0 versus CL0. And we, we said that this is li linear. But then we said that there could be different deviations from this. And what we had been studying in the last few lectures are these deviations from the scatchered plot. So the scatchered plot is linear if the receptor, the, if the ligand is present is, is in excess and the receptor binds in a simple bimolecular kinetics. Now, when the receptor there, the deviates from these, you have what is known as positive cooperativity and negative cooperat cooperativity. Okay. And that is what we looked at. So you look at the scatchered plot over here and there's negative cooperativity and positive cooperativity. And let me, uh, so these are the different cases that we looked at, different deviations. The first one we looked at is ligand depletion. So CL was no longer CL0, it became a quadratic equation. We solved it and we showed how to do that. Next was multiple receptors binding. And what was the difference between multiple, what is the point about multiple receptors? They were binding independently of each other. So two different receptors binding to the same ligand, but binding independently of each other. And then we looked at cases where multiple, there, there are not actually multiple receptors, but the receptors were changing conformations as a result of which their rate constants were changing. And they were essentially behaving like multiple receptors. So here is a summary of everything that we did in the last couple of lectures, last few lectures. So single receptor, when we have a single receptor, the scattered plot is linear and the dissociation kinetics is single exponential as it's written on the, in the table out here. When you have a single receptor but ligand is depleting, then the scattered plot is nonlinear and the dissociation kinetics is still single exponential. Now it's an interesting case of, next is an interesting case of two different receptor populations and the scatchet plot is nonlinear and the dissociation kinetics is double exponential and we discussed this at the beginning of this class that if the dissociation constant of one is very different, is very large as compared to the dissociation constant of the other, we are in business and we can separate out the uh, rate constant, the dissociation and dissociation rate constants of the two cases, otherwise it's very hard. Next we looked at the case for receptor ligand interconversion and uh, the scatchered plot is still linear as, as we just showed uh, and the dissociation kinetics is two or more exponential and this interconversion is what kind of interconversion? The receptor itself, the receptor subpopulation itself changes conformation becomes another receptor. So because both the, these are chemically the same, they both bind to the same ligand but the dissociation rate constants are different and they form different complexes which can also interchange that is interconvert through change of conformation. And then there are other cases which we didn't really study but these cases I just want to go through quickly. One is interconversion of ligand to a non-dissociable form and in this case the scatchered plot is linear and the dissociation kinetics is double exponential as you see over here. So interconversion of ligand to a non-dissociable form and then there is true cooperativity uh, in which case the scatchered plot is non-linear and the dissociation kinetics is double exponential. So, uh, uh, so let, let me go and show you this over here uh, what we had before here. So this multivalent ligand and these cases were receptor aggregation. So these are other cases that can happen. That is one ligand is binding to two receptors. That's a straightforward case, but a little more complex case is the case of receptor aggregation, which is that two receptors R plus R together form an aggregate and then this binds step by step with a ligand. So essentially you form LRRL which is two receptors binding to two ligands but they bond, bind as an aggregate which means that two receptors bind to one ligand first and then this ligand with the two receptor binds to the second ligand to form LRRL. So again the kinetics is here going to be a little different. The reason this is going to be a little different is that uh, the kinetics is going to be a little different is because uh, uh, dissociation and the association rate constants are varied over here and this is a case of cooperativity and I, if you remember at the beginning of this course of this chapter, I gave you the example of hemoglobin molecules, four hemoglobin molecules binding to oxygen step by step and this is a very parallel example of that. So two receptors binding to one ligand first and then the two receptor one ligand complex binding to the second ligand and forming two receptor two ligand complex. So there's a cooperativity out here and there's positive cooperativity. This is similar to the uh, hemoglobin oxygen binding. 
and then what will happen is the rate constants will be different at each of these steps and there will be different. So, two receptor binding to two ligand is different from the rate co the uh, simple case of one receptor binding to the rate constants would be different from one receptor to binding to one ligand. So, these are the different kinds of receptor ligand bindings that we talked of the kinetics of this. Now, where do these kinetics come into play? What is the, what are the real physical processes where these kinetics are very important and I had talked a little bit about this and the one particular case that we are going to look at and we are going to look at with respect to a particular disease which is familial hypercholesterolemia in the following lecture is receptor mediated endocytosis. So, receptor mediated endocytosis is a very important process and it is very important for se several biological and physiological processes and this is where the kinetics come in and the disease that we are going to talk about familial hypercholesterolemia is a genetic disorder and we are going to look at why this genetic disorder happens. Is it because of some kinetic disabilities that is some kinetic rate constants is lower than what they should have been and or some other reasons, you know, the complex is not being formed properly or not enough ligands or not enough receptors, what is the reason? So, this is a very practical and interesting example and ap uh, example and application of this theoretical study of receptor ligand binding. So, we did a purely theoretical study till here of receptor ligand binding, but we are going to apply it in the following lecture to uh, different diseases and the main thing that we are going to focus on is a process called receptor mediated endocytosis. With that, I will stop to today and we will talk about receptor mediated endocytosis in the following lecture. Thank you.